Good day. As I discussed in a recent program, given Japan's great economic power, its position as the world's、uh, third or fourth largest economy, depending on how you calculate these things, it is surprising how little interest there always is in political changes in Japan. Um, I say that in light of the recent election by Japan's Liberal Democratic Party, the party which has dominated Japanese politics ever since its formation in the early 1950s, it's surprising how little interest there is in the election of Fumio Kishida as the president of the Liberal Democratic Party and soon to be Prime Minister of Japan. One might have assumed. That the election or appointment, as in this case, of a new Japanese prime minister, the head of the Japanese government, the most important official in Japan, the person who runs Japanese policy, or so it would, so in theory,、uh, is the case that the appointment of such a person would attract international attention. Yet, that has barely been the case, and I think there are. First of all, a number of very obvious structural reasons why. Firstly, it's probably fair to say that though the Liberal Democratic Party has dominated Japanese political life since the 1950s, it is not the case that the Japanese Prime Minister, even when drawn from that party, as he almost always is,、um, do- dominates Japanese political life in the same way. The Liberal Democratic Party of Japan is famously factionalized, and political conflict or struggle within its ranks goes on almost continuously.、Um, it's often the case that a prime minister is、uh, elevated to, to power or seeming power as a result of agreement and consensus between the factions. And he governs very much at their bidding and at their will. When they decide that he no longer serves their purpose, they move on and pick someone else. Every so often, however, a strong personality emerges, like the recent Japanese Prime Minister, Mr. Abe, who does manage to stamp his mark on Jap- Japanese politics and is able to maintain his position as Prime Minister. For some time, and achieves a certain degree of paramountcy in Japanese affairs. And Mr. Abe did indeed carry out major policies in Japan itself, and he did also make an important mark on international politics. Also, however, nobody perhaps expects Mr. Fumio Kishida, who is Japan's、uh, new prime minister, to be. Uh, to do the same thing, even though he is likely to win the coming parliamentary election, which is due in November, the opposition in Japan to the Liberal Democratic Party is divided and fragmented, and hardly anybody that I know expects the Liberal Democratic Party to lose. Given that this is so, and given that Mr. Kishida is apparently An emollient figure. It's quite clear that it will be the party elders once again who dominate politics, as they have done for most of the time since the 1950s,、um, with occasional breaks when a strong personality takes the prime minister's office. In this case, as I said, Kishida hardly seems to be that sort of person. But nonetheless. Can we take any lessons from this? Because, of course, Japan, one can argue, stands at a very important juncture. It's almost valid to say it stands at a fork in the road. Now, this is not entirely new in Japan. There was、uh, a major、um, decisions taken in Japan in the 1950s, which restructured the Japanese、e- economic model. Up to that time, Japan. Had run its economy on the basis of a relatively weak yen.、Uh, industrial planning organised 
to a great extent through the Ministry of International Trade and Industry, um, exports, manufactured exports, and a policy which might be called a kind of economic mercantilism. This uh, provided Japan with decades of extremely rapid economic growth, and by the mid-1980s, it did seem as if Japan was an all-conquering economic and industrial behemoth. I can still remember the dismay and alarm Japan's economic rise caused in the United States at that time. But in the mid-1980s, it's fair to say that in, partly in response to American pressure, this uh, economic model was radically revised. Industrial planning essentially ceased, at least in the kind of centralised form which had existed previously. And Japan gradually started to recalibrate its economy away from exports and industry uh, and towards a more consumption-based economy. Now, there are many people who blame the the problems that the Japanese economy ran into afterwards as a result of this change in Japan's economic model. They say that the switch away from industrial planning and exports towards consumption uh, triggered a property boom in Japan, which left the Japanese financial system deeply indebted and in effect underwater, and that the stagnation or apparent stagnation of the Japanese economy since then has been a product of this. Well, that may be so, but for what it's worth, I'm not an expert on the Japanese economy and I'm not going to commit myself one way or another to saying whether that analysis is true. And I doubt any way that Mr. Kishida has the economic heft, uh, or rather the political heft, or the economic understanding to make major structural changes to this model. His predecessor, Mr. Abe, did concern himself with the uh, problems of Japan's industrial and apparent economic stagnation, but it has to be said that his approach to those problems, Abe economics, as it was called, did not seek a return to Japan's economic model of the 50s and 60s and 70s. Rather, it sought, it took the playbook that we've now seen repeated in the West, um, increasingly uh, loose monetary policies, quantitative easing, tax breaks, and all the rest, all of them intended to introduce an element of inflation into the economy in order to induce Japanese savers to stop saving and to start to spend in the hope that this would result in the economy becoming more um, dynamic again. I think most people would agree that though there was a certain uptick in growth in Japan during Mr. Abe's years, overall, this policy did not achieve quite as much as Mr. Abe and his fans perhaps expected that it would. But regardless, I don't expect a return, as I said, to the earlier model of Japanese economic planning and industrial and export growth. I doubt that Mr. Kishida is capable of pursuing such an approach. And to be straightforward about this, I think that the radical changes that have taken place in Japanese society since the um, uh, since that previous model existed, have now made a return to it politically impossible. But anyway, that's all I'm going to say about that. Perhaps more interesting is what Mr. Kishida is going to do in foreign policy, because it is it there where I think there is a fork in the road. Japan faces a fork in the road, and it must now make some very important and very difficult choices. And the reason it faces that fork in the road is because the rise of China, which now has an economy three times the size of Japan's, has completely changed uh, 
the geopolitical balance in the Pacific, and also because for the first time since the Second World War, there is now an active geopolitical conflict raging in the Pacific. In the, 90, in, in the 1940s, during the Second World War, that conflict was, of course, between Japan itself and the United States, and Japan was comprehensively and completely defeated. This time, it is a far more evenly matched conflict between the United States and China. And Japan needs to make a decision as to what it is going to do, given the growth of this conflict and the decisions that Japan must take with respect to it. And it seems to me that here Japan has a difficult choice to make. The first is, does it go along with the United States? Does it stick with its alliance with the United States and develop that alliance in a way that gives Japan a clear-cut anti-Chinese policy, one which aligns Japan with the United States and confronts China? And furthermore, if Japan does take that step, that really momentous step, what does Japan do if the United States, as it might do, starts to disengage? Does it continue with this anti-Chinese policy? Does it make various changes to its economic, political and constitutional system to reflect that fact? And how far does it go? Now, I talked about Japan's previous model, the model it pursued until the mid-1980s in, in terms of its economic policy, a focus on industrial planning and, and industrial exports. But I didn't mention what, in my opinion, was an essential component part of that model, which is that Japan, during that period, between the 1950s and mid-1980s, essentially avoided having any kind of active foreign policy at all. The Japanese military was kept under tight control. It, it did exist, though it was in theory always called the self-defense force because Japan's constitution has a highly pacific uh, nature, pacifist nature, as a result of the events of the Second World War. And by the way, American insistence in the years after the Second World War. And Japan liked it that way because by avoiding taking a strong stand on international questions or indeed on military or security questions, Japan was able to forge ahead with its trade and economic policies, its industrial uh, expansion and its exports all around the world in the knowledge that countries importing Japanese goods had no reason particularly to be alarmed by the growth of Japanese power. I would add that this heavy uh, concentration on production of civilian goods as opposed to military goods was probably also an important factor in firing up the Japanese export machine. Japan was able to devote all of its industrial uh, uh, resources, all its immense scientific and technological skills to producing those goods that the world wanted to buy, as opposed to those military goods which have far fewer buyers at any particular point of time, um, except during periods of armed conflict. So this previous pacifist policy or semi-pacifist policy, which Japan followed in the 50s and 60s and 70s and early 80s, you, one could say worked at that time very much to Japan's advantage. But of course, all of that was predicated on assumptions about the international situation. Now, the period I'm talking about, the 1950s to the 1980s, was, of course, the time of the Cold War. And the Cold War is often conceived of in the West as a period of superpower confrontation. 
and it is indeed the case that Japan at that time was an ally of the United States against the Soviet Union and therefore uh, was in a sense in conflict with the Soviet Union as it was an ally of the United States. Having said that, it's important not to overstate this. During the period of the Cold War, the main emphasis on super, superpower rivalry was in the North and in the Atlantic region, in Europe, and to a certain extent in the Middle East. These were the regions where US and Soviet power directly confronted each other. The Soviet Union did have a, a powerful Pacific fleet. It is a Pacific, it was a Pacific nation. It did have ports in places like Vladivostok and Hodka, and it did use the Sea of Ohotsk as it, a, 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 a place where it would base its nuclear submarines, particularly its ballistic missile submarines. By the way, modern Russia still does. And the Soviet Union also, of course, had a long-standing territorial dispute with Japan over certain islands in the Kuril chain, which the Soviet Union recaptured, or captured, as you prefer, in, uh, during the Second World War, but which continued to be claimed by Japan. But having said that, the reality is that the weight of Soviet power was not directed at the Pacific. Um, it was not really the case that the Soviet Union was interested at that time in confronting Japan. During the later part of the Cold War, in the 1960s and 1970s and early 1980s, to the extent that the Soviets were interested in the Pacific region and in Asia, it was principally to counterbalance their other great rival in the Pacific, which was China, with which at that time the Soviet Union was extremely hostile. So Japan, in a sense, had no particular reasons to worry about its security and about its international position during that time. It, it didn't need powerful armed forces because it was not being directly threatened. And to the extent that it was potentially threatened, it could rely on the enormous power of the United States military, which dominated the Pacific throughout the Cold War, as they had done, in fact, ever since the US victory in the Second World War. So the pacifist policies, or rather, if you prefer, the non-interventionist policies pursued by Japan during that period were policies that worked in Japan's interests and which Japan could afford to follow because in a situation where superpower rivalry was focused on Europe and on the Middle East, the Pacific was a relatively quiet area one which was burgeoning economically, but where the kind of conflicts that took place, especially in the northern Pacific, were frankly distant and remote from Japan. That, by the way, was also true, even in relation to that one conflict that did take place and which did involve the United States, and that is the conflict in Indochina, the war in Vietnam that the United States waged in the 1960s and early 1970s. It's easy for Westerners who are not familiar to the, with the Pacific region to underestimate the enormous distance between a country like Vietnam and Japan. Suffice to say that what was happening in Vietnam in the 1960s was of peripheral interest to Japan. It was not something that impinged directly on Japanese concerns. The Korean Peninsula, where there'd been a bitter war at the beginning of the 1950s, would have been a different matter. But it's also fair to say that throughout the 1950s, 60s, 70s, the situation on the Korean Peninsula appeared to be relatively stable with the United States military strongly positioned 
in Korea and North Korea posing very little threat. So Japan at that time felt stable, it felt secure, it could focus on its economic expansion, it didn't have to worry about security threats, it didn't need to worry much about a challenge from the Soviet Union. China at that time was an extremely poor country, completely dwarfed economically by Japan and both the Soviet Union and China to the extent to which they were significant powers in the Pacific in the 1960s and 70s were held in check by the immeasurably more powerful US military in the Pacific. So Japan didn't have to worry about foreign policy at that time. But today, the situation is radically different. Today, as we've discussed, there is a raging conflict in the Pacific. Indeed, it's probably fair to say that the conflict in the Pacific between China and uh, the United States is the central conflict today in world affairs. There is still a major conflict between the United States and Russia in Europe, but for American policymakers, increasingly, it is the conflict with China in the Pacific, the struggle for mastery in the Pacific, that is their major concern. And that, of course, brings Japan right into the forefront, into the midst of the battleground between the superpowers. And that, of course, must in turn make Japan reconsider its own military posture. Does it therefore do that which it didn't need to do in the 50s and 60s and 70s and early 80s? Does it need to rebuild its armed forces? Does it go down the path, for example, of acquiring nuclear submarines? Does it develop its air force? Does, does it develop its already very large navy? And does it offer to intervene in various hot spots in the Pacific? And if so, does it do so with it, its own interests, and on its own behalf, or in, in alliance with other countries, the United States, for example? Or does it instead try to play a middleman role, seeking to remain, at least to some extent, equidistant and Pacific between these two great rival camps? And on top of that, Japan has history. Because, of course, Japan, between the 1890s and the 1990s, was the dominant economic power in Asia, the dominant Asian economic power. It dwarfed China and every other Asian economy. Japan was the first Asian country to industrialize and industrialize seriously. By the 1920s and 1930s, it was so far ahead of all the other Asian powers that it even briefly and disastrously for itself attempted to force them into a kind of Japanese uh, uh, protectorate system, the so-called uh, um, Asia, East Asia, uh, a, a co-prosperity sphere, a policy which led Japan into a long conflict with China and which brought Japan ultimately into a catastrophic conflict with the United States. So Japan at that time was the dominant economic and technological and industrial power in the Pacific region in East Asia. And in the period after the Cold War, during the 50s and 60s and 70s, it appeared to be extending its lead. By the 1980s, it was entirely possible to see Japan as a country equal in every respect, in terms of its living standards, its technological and industrial prowess. It was possible to compare it and accept it as the equal of any Western power, something which was arguably not true of any of the other Asian states, certainly not true of China at that time. So that's now changed. Japan now finds that China, though inherently still a poorer country 
living standards in China still remain considerably below those in Japan. China now dwarfs it economically. It's three times Japan's size. And of course, around Japan, other economies have also now developed. South, South Korea, for example, Singapore and Hong Kong, the true entrepreneur states, are uh, now also prosperous, equally prosperous in Singapore's case, arguably with Japan itself. And even countries which the Japanese at one time saw as much poorer than themselves and which were intended to be part of the great East Asia co-prosperity -pros co sphere places like Indonesia, the Philippines, Malaysia, for example, are now uh, far more highly developed economically than was the case, let us say, in the 1960s. So the Japanese, looking at the world around them, looking at the Pacific around, around them, see a situation today which is completely different from what it was. They see the rise of Chinese power and the fact that China has now become conclusively the most powerful Asian state, dwarfing Japan, which had previously held that position. They see other countries in Asia um, uh, overtaking or at least achieving similar levels of prosperity to Japan's own. And they see their region today as a region of superpower conflict to an extent that was simply not the case during the Cold War. So what does Japan do? Now, there's been considerable uncertainty about this, partly because of residual concerns in Japan left over from the disaster of the Second World War. Japan's constitution remains pacifist and the sentiments of many of Japan's people continue to be pacifist also, especially, I suspect, many of its older people. And of course, there's also worries about how the other countries around Japan, countries like Indonesia, the Philippines, Malaysia, South Korea, and all the rest, countries that had previously, in the first half of the 20th century, been exposed to what they saw, rightly in my opinion, as Japan, Japanese aggression, how they would respond to a more assertive Japan and indeed how the world would respond to more, a more assertive Japan. Japan still is a major trading economy. Would it fear that if it took a more um, overtly interventionist position in world affairs, that it might find that there is, that, the, that political obstacles started to be raised against Japanese goods and Japanese investment? of a sort that we have not seen previously. So the Japanese need to consider all of that. On the other hand, and do they simply stand back? Do they allow things to continue as they are? Or do they instead try and become, as I said, a relatively neutral state, one which manages to balance between the competing great powers, one which works towards seeking some kind of stability and peace in Asia and tries to keep the rivalries between the two superpowers, the United States and China, under some sort of control. And we can see uh, shifts and uh, conflicts within Japan as Japan tries to feel its way towards a decision about this. So if we go back to Mr. Abe, who, as I said, dominated Japanese political life for a very long time, unusually long for a Japanese prime minister, he did seem to take a more um, abrasive line against China. He seemed to be inclined to tilt Japan closer towards an alliance with the United States. He seemed to be more critical of China altogether, and he seemed on balance, to be seeking to uh, use Japanese power in alliance with the United States to try and contain China. And the prime minister who succeeded Mr. Abe, Mr. Suga, who resigned after just a, 
very short period in office, he seemed to be not only continuing Mr. Abe's policies, but he seemed to be prepared to take these policies even a step further. He was, for example, a strong supporter. Mr. Suga was a strong supporter of the Quad, the arrangement bringing together the United States, Australia, Japan and India, um, an arrangement which for, admittedly falls far short of an actual alliance, but one which did seem to be clearly intended in some form as a containment mechanism uh, against directed against China. And so that now brings us back to Mr. Kishida, because what are Mr. Kishida's policies? And does he, in fact, even have any policies? And if he does have policies, what sort of policies, how effective is he going to be in implementing those policies? Now, the thing to say about Mr. Kishida is that unusually for a Japanese prime minister, he has very extensive experience of foreign, foreign policy. He was Japan's foreign minister uh, for a longer period than any other official in Japan's post-war history. So he is someone who understands and knows foreign policy extremely well. And not only does he know foreign policy extremely well, but he also has certain other um, aspects about him, or about his background, which might point in a certain direction. Firstly, he is absolutely a member of Japan's political elite and political class. His family are Liberal Democratic Party stalwarts. The, uh, uh, um, his father and uh, other members of his family were uh, members of the Japanese Diet, the Japanese Parliament, and he is connected to various uh, senior Japanese officials and politicians by uh, through various family connections. So he is experienced in foreign policy, and of course he is also someone who has strong political connections in Japan. And on top of that, he comes from Hiroshima, which is, of course, the city where the first U.S. atomic bomb was dropped. And many people believe that that is an important fact influencing his perspective on international affairs and indeed on domestic affairs, too. And it is a fact that in recent months he has taken steps which do seem to distinguish him from the approach previously taken by people like Mr. Abe and Mr. Suga. First of all, he's openly criticised Mr. Abe's economic policies, even though, of course, he was a member of the Japanese government when Mr. Abe was prime minister. Um, he's said that the only people who benefited from Mr. Abe's policies of inflating the economy through uh, uh, monetary easing and all the rest were rich people, He's also criticised something that he calls neoliberalism. We don't quite know what he means by that and whether he's at all serious in criticising neoliberalism. But it has been noticed and uh, those, those remarks of his have been noticed and, by the way, have provoked criticism of Mr Kishida in that great neocon financial journal the Financial Times, which, by the way, though a British newspaper, is largely owned by a Japanese financial group. And, of course, he's also spoken out, Mr. Kishida has spoken out, against revisions to Japan's pacifist constitution. He appears to oppose the nuclearization of Japan's military, and he doesn't seem to be particularly keen on the expansion of Japan's military either. And all of this might be taken to suggest that he takes a different line on these matters to that of Mr. Abe and Mr. Suga. In other words, rather than wanting to pursue a harsh anti-Chinese line, he inclines towards a more emollient approach towards Beijing, he wants to try and find some kind of modus vivendi with the Chinese. And the Japan, under, 
with him as Prime Minister, far from seeking conflict in the Indo-Pacific region against China, would, on the contrary, try to act as a stabilising factor in Pacific affairs, seeking to bring some kind of peace and measure of calm to this superpower conflict, which is raging in the Pacific. Having said that, it's important to say that though Mr Kishida has made those comments and made those statements, it's also true that he has made some very harshly critical comments about China also. To be frank, I don't put a huge amount of weight on these, given the head of steam against China that has built up in Japan in recent years. It'd be very difficult for a Japanese politician to rise to the post of prime minister if he did not make at least ritual comments critical of Beijing. Having said that, the fact that Mr Kishida has to make comments like this begs the question whether even if he does want to pursue a more accommodative policy towards China, he would be able to do so. I've already said that there is a very strong current of feeding against China in Japan and that's been building up for some time and which is reflected in the line taken by Mr Abe and Mr Suga. And if we look at the recent elections for the leadership of the Liberal Democratic Party, the elections which Mr Kishida has just won, it's a striking fact that there were other candidates, like, say, the Interior Minister, Mr. Sanai Takaichi, who apparently wanted to take a much stronger anti-Chinese line and who did, in fact, pitch themselves as opposed to China in much more clear-cut terms than those which Mr. Kishida was prepared to articulate. And it is a fact that Mr. Takaichi that he was, defe though defeated by Mr Kishida, nonetheless did put a very strong sh showing in those elections. Indeed, if one looks through uh, the elections carefully, it becomes clear that the only reason why Mr Kishida actually won and became president of the Liberal Democratic Party is because he had the backing of key figures within the party's parliamentary leadership. In Amongst the grassroots, other, more abrasive candidates, people who might be expected to take a much stronger uh, anti-China line, seem to do better. And that therefore begs the question of whether, even if Mr Kishida was prepared to take a more uh, emollient pol a line towards China, um, even if he were seeking to try to pacify uh, relations between China and Japan and were to try to position Japan as a factor for stability and peace in the Pacific, he would be able to do so. Well, I'm going to say straight away that, of course, I don't know and I don't know how strong a personality Mr Kishida is going to turn out to be, but I would say one thing which may work in his favour, or at least in favour of the more Pacific policy that I've talked about, and that is precisely the fact that Mr Kishida had the support of the uh, LDP's parliamentary factions. Now, the faction leaders know Mr Kishida very well. As I said, he's been around in Japanese politics for a very long time. And as I said, he is, through his family, a absolute central figure, a, an absolute uh, uh, um, insider within the Japanese political class and political system. So it's not as if Mr Kishida is an unknown person. And they will have known about the fact that he is... Uh, from Hiroshima, that he supports the pacifist constitution, that he is somebody who doesn't want to see uh, further milit or says he doesn't want to see further militarization of Japan, and that he's spoken out against Mr. Abe's economic policies, and that he's spoken out against 
neoliberalism, whatever it is exactly, that he means by that. And I can't help but think that the fact that they backed him and ensured thereby that he becomes Japan's prime minister is an indicator that they are starting to worry that things uh, between Japan and China are going too far, that tensions have been allowed to rise further than perhaps was wise and ultimately good for Japan, and that they actually supported Kishida as a foreign policy expert, as somebody who they could trust as a safe pair of hands to, uh, shall we say, straighten the boat and bring Japanese-Chinese relations on a more even and calmer footing. If that is correct, if, that, if I'm right about that, then despite this head of steam, which I discussed, which is building up in Japan itself, it could very well be that the uh, anti-China hawks will, to some extent at least in Japan, be, if not entirely marginalised or shut out of the picture. That's never the Japanese way, by the way, at least given less prominence. And that Japan will indeed try over the next few months, or perhaps even years, to try to sort out its relations with China and return them to a more balanced and calm situation than we have seen up to now. And it ought to be said that there are um, factors which, quite apart from the danger for Japan of a great superpower struggle in which Japan gets drawn in and is committed to defending Taiwan, for example, uh, there are certain factors which would uh, uh, make Japan perhaps want to seek better relations with China. After all, China is Japan's biggest trading partner at the moment. It's a major uh, place where Japanese companies have heavily invested. A lot of Japanese manufacturing actually now takes place in China, on the Chinese mainland. I wouldn't have thought that many industrial groups in Japan would want to see the relationship with China go completely to pieces because of the damage it would do to Japan's industrial and economic fabric. So there are factors that work towards a calmer relationship between Japan and China. And the Chinese, for their part, seem to be thinking that Mr. Kishida's election and emergence as Japan's prime minister might also signal at least perhaps not a rapprochement between Japan and China. I think that's altogether too much to expect, but at least a limited detente. And we see that, in effect, said by a long article, editorial in fact, in the usual place, Global Times. And Global Times, China's uh, semi-official English language voice, has set out a list of steps that Japan should take under Mr. Kushida, presumably, in order to bring relations between China and Japan back to a position of friendship. Now, I'm going to say I've read through these proposals, and I have to say I think that they are wildly overambitious in terms of what Japan can realistically be expected to do, or at least what Mr. Kishida can be realistically expected to do. But I will nonetheless read them out and then just briefly talk about them. So first of all, we read in Global Times the following. Japan should not shape itself as China's enemy under any circumstances. To this end, the following is crucial for Japan. First, Japan should not return to the road of militarism. Japan has been eager to amend its pacifist constitution in recent years, 
The amendment is obviously aimed at its neighbouring countries, especially China. This will trigger great vigilance amongst neighbouring countries and produce a chain reaction. Japan seeks to revise the post-war constitution to further legitimise the self-defence forces, possess nuclear-powered submarines and build long-range strike capabilities. Note, by the way, the reference to nuclear-powered submarines. That's clearly a swipe at the uh, uh, recent deal between the United States and Australia for nuclear technology to be provided to Australia to supply nuclear powered, so that uh, Australia can build a fleet of nuclear powered submarines. The Chinese are in effect saying that um, the Japanese hanker after nuclear powered submarines also, and they will treat this deal as a green light And if they want better relations with China, they mustn't do that. Anyway, to continue, if these plans are put into practice, it will definitely increase the tension and even hostility between Japan and the entire surrounding region. Second, Japan cannot participate in any multilateral military alliance that clearly targets China. If the quad mechanism that Japan has already joined is transformed into a military alliance, the effect will be the same. They will all strongly ramp up the hostility between China and Japan. Third, Japan's uh, self-defense forces should not blatantly provoke China like the US military. Under no circumstances should they trigger military frictions between China and Japan. Fourth, China needs to, Jap- Tokyo needs to be particularly cautious in terms of the Taiwan question. If Japan stirs up the muddy waters of the Taiwan Straits, it is very diff- likely to trigger a new war with China. Fifth, in regard to old issues, including the visits to the Yasukuni Shrine, textbooks and the Diaoyu Islands, Japan has to ramp up efforts to control its differences with China and it should not easily exploit any of them as a card. In particular, it should not engage in new moves to break Japan's prior practices. Sixth, in the tech war against China waged by the US, Japan should not coordinate with the US to establish Uh, uh, a supply chain excluding China in a bid to undermine China's economic future. This would be a prominent sign that Tokyo sees Beijing as an enemy. Well, those are the six conditions that the Chinese, or at least Global Times, is laying out for a, a easing of relations between Japan and China. And I have to say, very much in the style of Global Times, this is all set out in a rather peremptory way. But let's let's unpack it and let's see how realistic or not some of these proposals are. Well, firstly, Japan should not return to the road of militarism, should not revise its constitution, and should not seek, in other words, to build up its armed forces, and should certainly not try to acquire nuclear submarines or long-range strike capabilities. Well, I have to say that it's all very well for the Chinese to tell the Japanese what they can and cannot do in security terms, but ultimately the Japanese will have to make their own decisions here. I don't know whether or not Japan will go down the route of developing nuclear-powered submarines. It certainly has that capability, but I would be surprised if Japan did not take some steps to acquire long-range missiles. I say that because irrespective of what is going on between China and the United States, I would be very surprised indeed if the Japanese did not feel that they need long-range missiles in order to reinsure their position, either against China or conceivably against North Korea, which is becoming a major military force Uh, in the Korean Peninsula, which is, of course, very close to Japan itself. So I think that certainly the Chinese can have a dialogue with Japan on military questions. It's certainly true that the Japanese can provide 
the Chinese with some degrees, some degree of understanding and assurances and perhaps open communications channels with the Chinese about the over these matters. But as I said, to exclude them entirely from developing long range missile capabilities, I think that's frankly unrealistic and is an excessive demand. Second. Japan cannot participate in any multilateral military alliance, which clearly targets China, and that would include the Quad, if the Quad were to become a military alliance. Well, I have to say straight away, that I don't think there's any prospect of the Quad becoming a military alliance targeted against China. As I discussed in the recent programme, India, for its part, has entirely ruled out that possibility. But... What this second demand perhaps um, overlooks is that Japan is already an ally of the United States. There are extensive defense arrangements between Japan and the United States, which date all the way back to the Second World War. And to be straightforward about it, I think for any Japanese government, those uh, arrangements between Japan and the United States are non-negotiable. So uh, when the Chinese say that Japan cannot participate in any multilateral military alliance that clearly targets China, that perhaps overlooks the fact that Ch Japan is already a bilateral military ally of the United States, and there is nothing that the Japanese can do to prevent the United States from forging alliances of their own with other Pacific allies, like Australia, for example. However, if what the Chinese are talking about here is that Japan should hold aloof from any Pacific NATO system that the United States uh, were to try to create, well, that, I think, is perhaps a more realistic uh, um, demand. Though I have to say that I think the chances of a Pacific NATO led by the United States directed against China ever being established are very far from good. In fact, I don't expect it to happen. Next, third, Japan's uh, self-defense forces should not blatantly provoke China like the US military. Well, to all intents and purposes, I don't see that happening to any real extent anyway. I can't very well imagine, for example, Japan goading the Chinese uh, in the South China Sea in the way that the United States Navy is doing. But frankly, why would Japan even want to do something like that? But, you know, if we're talking about things closer to home, like, say, disputes over fishing rights or, 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 or clashes over uh, disputed island chains, well, I'm afraid the reality is that that sort of thing happens. And again, the priority is to try to find ways to manage it rather than to seek um, to try to prevent things like that happening at all. I think that is simply not realistic. Now, the, the fourth part, the fourth demand, if I, I would call them demands, by the way, I think is entirely justified. Tokyo needs to be particularly cautious in terms of the Taiwan question. If Japan stirs up the muddy waters of the Taiwan states, it is very likely to trigger a new war with China. Now, I think, actually, of all of these six demands, that is far and away the single most important one, because there have been reports recently, I've discussed them in recent programmes, about some people in the United States, and to some extent in Japan also, seeking to uh, deploy the Japanese Navy to counterbalance the Chinese Navy in a conflict over Taiwan, with the Japanese Navy, in effect, acting in concert with the US Navy in that kind of conflict. And I wonder, and I say this without any knowledge of these things, if one of the reasons why Mr. Kishida obtained the backing of the political establishment of the Liberal Democratic Party of Japan, 
is because at least some of the members of that political establishment were becoming increasingly nervous about all the talk that was circulating in the international media that the Japanese Navy would indeed be deployed to defend Taiwan in that kind of way. I have to say that on this, this is the clearest warning of all. If Japan starts getting involved, drawing, getting too close to a conflict over Taiwan with China, then it risks war with China. And that obviously is not in Japan's interests. It, Japan's interests are best served by peace on the Taiwan Straits, peace between China and Japan, uh, between Taiwan and Ch Ch China, I should, should say, between Taiwan and China. And that means, in effect, Japan ought to be working to dissuade the Taiwanese leaders from declaring independence from China, something which might precipitate a war between China and Taiwan, in which Japan has no interest or no need to become involved. So I think this is a key issue. I think on this one, the Chinese probably will find that there's quite a few people, perhaps including Mr. Kishida himself, who think as they do on this topic, that in fact, Taiwan, uh, Japan really needs to steer very clear of the Taiwan issue and certainly does not want to see a crisis in the Taiwan Straits and a crisis between Taiwan and China, which might drag in J Japan. So on that, I think that most important point of all, I think there might actually be some community of understanding between China and Japan. Continuing, in regard to old issues, including visits to the Yakusuni Shrine, textbooks and the Daioyu Islands, Japan has to ramp up efforts to control its differences with China. Now, this is, uh, this touches on some very sensitive symbolic issues. The Yasukuni Shrine is a shrine, uh, um, a, a, a Shinto shrine in Japan, which many Japanese politicians visit nowadays, and where the, um, various people whom uh, the Chinese consider war criminals dating from the period of Japan's intervention in, the, uh, in uh, wars against China in the first half of the 20th century are commemorated. And that is for the Chinese a sensitive issue. It's also, it must be said, a sensitive issue in Japan too. And of course, there's also arguments about textbooks and about the way in which the Japanese discuss those wars. And of course, there's also these islands, this island chain, what the Chinese call the Daioyu Islands, which the Chinese claim, which are currently occupied by Japan. Now, here, perhaps it's important to say that the Chinese are not straightforwardly demanding that the Japanese stop visits by their politicians to the Yakusuni Shrine or scrap their textbooks. Uh, 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 or, or, or completely change their policies over the disputed islands. What they're saying is that the Chinese, need, the Japanese, need to handle these issues with a certain measure of, of sensitivity and not seek to escalate tensions over them. And then the last, the sixth one, is in my opinion, uh, uh, in some ways, the most interesting because it points so much to the nature of economic, uh, of the economic war, which is waged, being waged between China and the United States alongside the geopolitical one. And we read that in the tech war against China, waged by the United States, Japan should not coordinate with the United States to establish a supply chain excluding China in a bid to undermine China's economic future. Well, again, the Chinese can make these kind of demands of Japan. They can say that Japan, for example, should not try to set up, you know, microchip manufacturing, which is focused on the United States and that cuts out China from supply chains and all that sort of thing. But ultimately, 
The Japanese must be masters of their economic future, like every other country, and they have a right to trade with whomever they please and to set up their own supply chains with whomever they please. And um, again, I don't think this is a realistic de demand coming from China in the sense that I don't believe, can't really see how Japan is in a, China is in a position to dictate Japan's trade and economic policies. And to be straightforward about it, I think such a demand is excessive and is certain to be rejected. But it does perhaps give an insight into China's particular sensitivities at the moment. The feeling that many Chinese have, with a great deal of justice, by the way, that the United States is trying to put China under some kind of economic siege at the moment. Anyway, regardless, it's interesting to see that demand there. But as I said, I don't really see how the Japanese could accede to it, even if they were minded to do so. And I can't imagine that they would, in fact, do so. So here we see the outline of what the Chinese say they're demanding from Japan. And as I said, it is excessive, but there is a core of, I think, negotiable issues, or at least negotiable points. I think you could say, for example, that Japan should abide by its current pacifist constitution. It should not seek to acquire nuclear-powered submarines and nuclear technologies. And it should certainly not seek to become an overt ally of China by entering into multilateral alliances against China along the framework of NATO. And it would, should also, above all, stay away from any conflict in the Taiwan Straits and drop any of these reckless ideas that have been floated recently of the Japanese Navy steaming to Taiwan's rescue alongside the US Navy in the event of a conflict between Taiwan and China. So I, I think you can see here certain core issues between China and Japan where the Japanese probably would feel able to make some move towards China, at least those Japanese leaders who might be inclined to such a step, and where some kind of understanding between China and Japan could potentially be reached. And in my opinion, that would be enough. I think that if Japan, for example, were to develop supply chains which excluded China from the uh, uh, with the United States, well, my own feeling is the Chinese, despite what Global Times says, could live with that. It also seems to me that if there were fishing disputes between China and Japan, uh, that they could live with that also. That happens with many countries. But I think that on the core issues of Japan not developing its military to the point where it threatens China or other or, or could potentially threaten China and other Pacific states and to the extent of Japan also agreeing that it's not a party to the Taiwan dispute. Well, in that case, I think a modest vivendi between Japan and China could be reached. China's core concerns would be satisfied. Japan would have preserved its freedom of action, its long-standing ties with the United States, but would not have overcommitted itself to a conflict with China, which is objectively very much contrary to its interests. Well, is that possible? Is that what's going to happen? As I said, I think there is a chance that Mr. Kishida has been picked for the post of Japanese Prime Minister, partly because of his foreign policy experience, partly because of his uh, uh, background and stated positions on all these questions, specifically in order, maybe, to try to negotiate some kind of modus vivendi with China. Now, in saying all of this, I want to emphasise that we're not 
talking here about any kind of diplomatic revolution. I absolutely do not believe, expect Japan to realign with China against the United States, for example. That is not something that is on the cards in the currently foreseeable future. If things take, take a different turn, there's a major economic crisis in the United States, if there is a major retreat by the United States from the Pacific, if there is a growing imbalance between Chinese and American power in the Pacific, well, things might change. But I think in that event, there might also be pressures in Japan to take more active steps for Japan to protect itself from a possible domination by China, if that is indeed what were to happen. But we are not looking at that kind of situation today. Today we're looking at a geopolitical rivalry in the Pacific between two approximately evenly balanced great powers. And Japan, it seems to me, has an interest in not uh, in seeing that this rivalry does not get out of control. And whilst a long-term ally of the United States would want to, in my opinion, in its own interests, seek to moderate this conflict in order to preserve stability in the Pacific region. And Japanese assurances to China that any Japanese military build-up will be carefully co uh, coordinated or discussed with China in advance and will stop short of provocative things like nuclear-powered submarines, and nuclear weapons and long-range bombers and such things. And um, any long-range missiles will be limited in their number and will basically be used as a conceivable uh, insurance against perhaps a threat from North Korea. Those sort of things, together with Japanese assurances that Japan is not a party to the Taiwan conflict and has no intention of becoming one. Well, all of that, I think, would be well received in Beijing and would be the basis of an understanding. And it would serve to stabilise the Pacific region and prevent it tipping over into a major conflict. Well, will that all happen? Well, we shall see. I, I mean, I stress again, there is a very big head of steam in Japan, which is very hostile to China. As um, the Global Times actually says, uh, Japan is a close neighbour of China and its development was once far ahead of China. Japan had not only shown its disdain for China, but had also invaded and hurt China. In the face of the new reality that China's GDP is three times that of Japan's, the latter society has not psychologically adapted to the situation and even has some fear. So the Chinese are aware that it is the enormous growth in their power which has unsettled Japan. And what they're saying there, again, one might take some exception at some of the language, but ultimately what they're saying is basically true. But having said that, as I said, Japan can perhaps try and get over all of this, can in its own interests try to navigate a course through this great period of conflict between China and the United States in the Pacific, can control its um, alarm or, or fear, if you like, or the fear of part of its people about this great growth of Chinese power and can seek a modus vivendi with China, which will preserve peace in the Pacific. Well, I'm going to say it straight away that as everybody, all of you will no doubt have gathered, I hope that is what happens. And I hope that Mr. Kishida's appointment does indeed point that way. I don't say that with any absolute confidence. As I said, um, there is clearly a growth of anti-Chinese sentiment in Japan, which has a historical and um, present 
basis. And of course, there is also the case that in the event that the United States puts pressure on Japan to align closely with the United States against China, well, that pressure on Japan will be pressure which Japan might find difficult to resist. But it does seem to me that Japan does have a choice. And the fact that it has picked Mr. Kishida to be its prime minister might point to the fact that it has made what I believe is the correct choice. If so, then we could start to see over the next few months and perhaps years, Japan playing a stabilizing role in the conflict in the Pacific. Certainly, that's what I hope for. Anyway, thank you for joining me for this long program today on this complex and intricate subject. I look forward to you joining me again soon in further programs on this channel and on our main channel, The Duran, where I do programs with my colleague and friend, Alex Christoforo. Please also remember, by the way, to check out Alex's own channel. You can find links under this video. Please also remember to come to our uh, uh, other platforms. And here in particular, I'm referring to Locals, where we have a thriving community, which is now involved in doing all sorts of exciting things where many of them are posting all sorts of things on this uh, uh, on on this platform and where of course Alex and I increasingly post our own uh, uh, exclusive content including various analytical videos which I do on a variety of different topics some of which I don't feel able to cover on YouTube and also by the way we're now increasingly doing live streams which appear on locals and in soon, before very long, exclusive live streams, which will be appearing on Locals too. And also you can find us on various other platforms also, BitChute, Library, Rumble, Odyssey, and all the rest. And of course, if you want to support us, you can support us by coming on to, by, by uh, via Patreon and Subscribestar, and by going to our shop, buying the amazing things you will find there, our famous magic mugs, our hats, our hoodies, our sweatshirts, our t-shirts, and all the rest. Lastly, if you like this video, please remember to press the like button, and please also press check your subscription to this channel. Thank you for joining me today. I look forward to you joining me again soon, and have a wonderful day until then.